For anyone who is preparing to get their real estate license in Illinois or any state at all, you would have realized that there are a lot of vocabulary words that you need to learn. So in today's video, this is going to be an ABC of real estate vocabulary. So I'm gonna go through words from the letter A to the letter Z and give you the vocabulary terms with some examples as we go through. So grab your notebook, grab something to write with and let's jump right in. But before we do, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Nonye and I am your real estate tutorist. I'm a licensed agent in Illinois as well as a licensed instructor. On this channel, I bring you the best tips and tools to getting your real estate license. Also answer any questions you may have about the process. If you're new, be sure to like this channel. And if you find value here, please uh, let me know in the comments. All right, so let's jump right in. A, B, C of vocabulary. Let's start with the letter A, addendum. If you look at the first three letters, the word add is there. This should help you remember the word. This is when you're adding to the contract. For example, you're working with a buyer. The buyer has done an inspection and there are some issues with the property that they want the seller to address. Instead of the seller fixing the property, the seller offers to give them money so that they can fix the issue when they move in. That's called credits. So when the seller is doing this, we have to add it on to our initial contract that did not have those funds. So an addendum is an addition to a contract. Second word, B for blind advertising. When you are advertising as a real estate licensee, you must advertise with your sponsoring broker's name your name as well, identifying yourself as a licensed agent. And sometimes you may have to put a phone number, address, those types of things, depending on the nature of your advertising. So any kind of advertising done by a licensed agent, a licensed broker, must include the sponsoring broker's information and other verbiage in there so that people know that you are licensed. Signs that say things like, we buy homes, and just a phone number, that should not be a licensed person advertising their brokerage services. C for contract. A contract is a voluntary agreement between both parties in order to do something. So you're trying to buy a house, buyer and seller agree to the terms of the contract. Remembering that contracts must always be for something legal the people entering into the contracts must have what we call legal capacity. They are mentally able to make that decision and also age-wise, they're old enough to make that decision as well. So a contract is an agreement between two or more people to do something. Usually it should be in writing if you need it to be enforceable in court. D for deed. This is the document that's used to convey or transfer ownership of real estate. When someone is either selling or gifting real estate, the deed is prepared from the person who is giving it, who is the grantor, to the person who is receiving it, who is the grantee. And that is your deed. It only transfers real property, real estate. E is for easements. Easement is someone's right of way to use someone else's property. An easement cannot occur when it is your property. You have to be using someone else's property. For example, you need access to the main road and the only way to get to the main road is by going through your client, your neighbor's property. That's an example of an easement. F for freehold estate. Freehold estate, think ownership. This is your possessory interest of real estate and it is not for any duration of time. You could own real estate, for example, for as long as you want or until someone dies, right? So freehold estate is a, whenever you see that possessory interest, it means you have the rights to live in the property 
and this is for no set amount of time. Opposite of freehold will be a leasehold. So think about a rental. You don't own it and your right to live there is for a period of time. Ground lease. The word there, ground, so they're leasing the ground, they're leasing the land, they're leasing the earth. This is where a tenant will lease just the land and then build on it they're paying the landowner rent every month. They're using whatever structure they built on the land for their purposes, usually business. And these leases are usually for a long period of time, sometimes 20 years, 30 years. And when that's over, they could either renew or just move on to another location, leaving the structure there sometimes. So that is your ground lease. Usually in the ground lease, the tenant is responsible for maintenance of the property, responsible for um, the taxes on the real estate, on the house structure that's there, and all the other maintenance. The owner of the land is just collecting their rent. Hold over tenancy. This exists when you have an estate for years tenancy, for example, a one year lease. And then after the one year is over, the landlord doesn't kick you out, but rather you become a month to month tenant. That is your hold over tenancy. So on the screen there, I said it's when your tenancy for years or estate for years, that's another term for it, converts to a tenancy from period to period, period, month, month to month, or year to year. When you know this has happened is when the landlord is collecting rent. So when they collect the rent, they're essentially renewing it for another period. And that's your holdover tenancy. Intestate. This is when a person dies without a will versus testate, which is when a person dies with a will. J is for joint tenancy. In joint tenancy, all the co-owners own equal interest in the property. So if you have three owners, each person owns 33%. If you have five owners, each person owns 20% of the real estate. And these co-owners have what's called a right of survivorship, meaning if one person passes away, their interest is essentially shared among the survivors. So if you have five people, one person passes away, the remaining four now own 25% of the property. Then one person passes away, the remaining three would own 33%. One person goes, now it's two people, 50-50. And then out of the two, one passes, now it's just one person left, and they own it in severalty. When there is joint tenancy, the presence of a will does not affect what happens to the interest of someone who dies. K is for kickback. Kickback is any kind of fee or compensation that is paid out for services not rendered. So it's kind of like an undisclosed business referral fee, and that's called a kickback. According to RESPA laws, this is illegal. Latent defects. A latent defect is one where you are unable to see it or notice it through an inspection of the property. For example, maybe behind the drywall, the foundation is cracked. So when we, come, when we come to look at the property, we cannot see what's behind the drywall to know what's happening there. And that is an example of a latent defect. According to Illinois law, if we know of a latent defect, the seller is and the agent are required to disclose it to any potential buyers. 
Okay, so in Illinois, we disclose all known latent defects. Meets and bounds legal description. This is a kind of legal description whereby we are describing land based on the property's boundaries. So think about the land being like a rect rectangle. So we're using different markers or boundaries around the property and distance and angles to help us define the land around its boundaries. This is the oldest method ever used. We start at the point of beginning and we go clockwise all the way around the property till we come back to that point of beginning. For our boundary markers, we could either use man-made monuments or we could use natural monuments. N is for novation. In novation, we are substituting an old contract for a new one. For example, let's say that a buyer is trying to buy a new construction property from a developer. They have a contract and they're going through the buying process. A couple weeks before closing, there is a hurricane that essentially destroys the property that the buyer was going to purchase. And now the buyers, of course, they can't purchase that home. But the developer is like, well, I have this other home. It's actually better in a nicer, a nicer lot, better views. I'll sell it to you for the same price that I was going to sell this one to you. Will you take it? If you agree, now you both enter into, uh, the buyer and the developer will enter into a new agreement to purchase that different property. So that's an example of a novation. O is for open listing. This type of listing, because as the word says, it is open. The seller is open to work with as many brokerages as they see fit. And they essentially promise to pay the broker or brokerage that brings them the buyer. Patent defect. For letter L, we talked about latent defects. And then here we're talking about patent defects. Essentially, they're opposite of each other. With latent, you can't see it through a visual inspection. With patent, you can see it through a visual inspection of the property. For example, if you notice water in the basement when you go there, maybe seeping in through a crack or something. That's a patent defect. Or you are inspecting the roof and notice that some shingles are out and things like that. That also would be classified as a patent defect. A quit claim deed. A quit claim deed is a deed whereby the interests of the grantor or the current owner are transferred over to the grantee who will become the new owner. Whatever interest the seller has or the grantor has is what the grantee is going to get. If the seller has nothing, the grantee gets nothing. In a quit claim deed, the grantor makes no promises of ownership or anything. All they're saying is whatever interest I have, I'm giving over to you. Quit claim deeds are used to cure a cloud in title. Remember that for the exam. Remainder interest. So if you think of the word remainder, you're thinking about something that's left over, right? So remainder interest usually happens in a life estate. When the life estate terminates, if the property is going to someone other than the original creator of the life estate, then it will be a remainder interest that that person has. For example, a, fa a grandfather passes on their real estate to the son as the life tenant and says that the property belongs to the son as long as the son is alive. When the son passes away, the property goes to the grandchild. The grandchild has a remainder interest 
they have the right to a future to interest in that property at the end of their father's life tenancy. And that is a remainder interest. It's different from a reversionary interest, whereby in the same scenario, instead of going to the grandchild, it will go back to the grandfather. That would be reversion, going back. S is for sale, lease back. So look at those two words. You sell and then you lease it back. This is usually done by um, commercial real estate owners, people that own industrial or manufacturing plants. They have the land, they build the real estate on it, then they sell the entire property and rent it back from the new owner. So the seller becomes the tenant and the landlord is the previous buyer of the property. Transfer tax. This is a tax that's levied by the state, county, and sometimes by the municipality or local government whenever there is a sale of real estate, whenever there is a transfer of ownership of real estate. Depending on where you are, this fee, this transfer tax is either paid by the seller, by the buyer, or by both. It just depends on the municipality. State and county are paid by the seller. Municipality, it could be both. It could be one or the other. So that is your transfer tax. In the state of Illinois, the transfer tax for a state is 50 cents per $500 or fraction thereof. And for county, it is 25 cents for every $500 or fraction thereof. Know those formulas for the exam. I have other videos on this channel about transfer taxes. So if you don't know what that is, be sure to check out another video and learn about transfer taxes there. Usury. This is where you are charging a person interest on money that they borrow from you, but the interest rate you're charging them is more than what is allowed by law. In the state of Illinois, when it comes to the purchase of real estate, there, is, there are no usury laws. Okay, so there are no usury laws in when we come to purchasing real estate in the state of Illinois, but you gotta know what usury is in case you see it on the exam. Example, let's say the maximum you can charge someone is 20%, but now you're charging them 25%. That would be an example of usury. Voluntary lien. Like the first word there says, voluntary is with your consent, with your approval. And then a lien is you owe money and your property is collateral for the debt. So a voluntary lien is one that you enter with your consent. An example is a mortgage lien. So with the mortgage, you go out, you take a mortgage, you sign the paperwork that says, yes, my house is collateral for the debt. And now you have entered into a voluntary lien. A warranty deed. A warranty deed, sometimes known as a general warranty deed, is a type of deed. Remember, the deed is a document that transfers ownership from one person to the other. So the general warranty deed is one that has five covenants or warranties or promises, essentially saying that the title is clean and clear. And if any issues come up in the future, I, the grantor, will handle them, even if it means I have to refund you your purchase price. So this provides great protection for the person who is buying it because you have all these promises that this property is yours and if any issue comes up, I will handle it. And that is your general warranty deed. For the exam, know the five covenants because they could ask you questions about it. Exclusive right to sell listing agreement. This is our X because I couldn't find a word that starts with the letter X. This listing agreement is exclusive, meaning the seller only works with one brokerage to sell their property. 
And then the right to sell means that regardless of who brings the buyer or who procures the buyer, the broker will be compensated. For example, Nancy is trying to sell her property and she enters into an exclusive right to sell listing agreement with ABC Realty. Nancy goes to work and her co-worker, Julie, is like, oh, I want to buy this, your house. I saw it's for sale. Nancy tells her, talk to my agent. And even if the co-worker buys the property, the broker still gets paid because of the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. Why? Why is for year to year tenancy? Well, this is an example of a periodic tenancy or a tenancy from period to period. A tenancy from period to period or a periodic tenancy is one where it is not for a definite period of time, but it's from for one period to the other. And then every time we, re we pay the rent and the landlord accepts the rent, we're essentially renewing the tenancy or the lease for another period. So a year to year tenancy is your tenancy or your lease is for one year. And then after that year, you renew it for another year. But we don't have a deadline. We don't have a definite end to your lease. If I wanted to terminate a year to your lease, I have to give you a 60 day notice. For a month to month, I have to give you a 30 day notice. For a year to year, I have to give you a 60 day notice. And that is your year to the year tenancy. And Z is for zoning. Zoning is a tool the government uses to regulate the use of land and also to limit the amount of businesses in a certain area. So in some areas, let's say there is a hair salon there and you want to open a hair salon in some municipalities, they won't allow you to open another hair salon within a certain distance from the one that's already there. That's zoning. Zoning also regulates things like um, when you're building your house, how close can the house be to the sidewalk? That's a zoning um, ordinance. How high can you build? That's zoning. What can you use the land to build? Can you build commercial on there? Can you build residential on there? Can you build a manufacturing plant? All of those things, the land is zoned for a certain use. And if you're going to build or live there, you're going to comply with that zoning ordinance and that is your zoning all right so those are the words i hope this was beneficial to you and as you saw for some of them like the letter x i had to be a little creative and so let me know in the comments how you're feeling as you are preparing for the exam what are you doing to help you remember the vocabulary words I may recommend getting a piece of paper or a notebook and just writing out all the words that you're having a hard time remembering so that you have a little cheat sheet that you could just reference when you need to remember what the words mean. Also, if you have a textbook from your school, there's usually a glossary that has some of the terms. So be sure to use that as well. But it's always better if you're able to actually articulate the, the definition in your own words so don't try to memorize the, the meaning. Be able to talk about what it means. On the exam, you will not have to write out the actual definition of a word. You just need to understand the general concept. So be able to use it in a sentence and things like that. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.